Today we got a 2012 Dodge Ram in the shop and we're going to be taking all my how-to videos and compiling it into one install. So we're going to be doing a data starter and security system from Directed. We're going to be doing a monoblock, a four channel, a doubled in screen from JVC, and two JLW3s in a custom enclosure. Our harness is all done now, so before I put in the vehicle we're going to show you what we've done. You can see here, Logan has gone ahead and cut everything to length here and made his attachments so we have a nice uniform look. Everything's soldered in shrink tube. We're using a module to turn on the deck because we have to integrate with the CAN bus system. And also gives us some other signals too that we would need if we're using a navigation deck or a screen like um, when we're using our uh, e-brake signal in this case. And then over here you can see we're running our 9 wire that's going to go from our 4 channel amplifier to back into the stock harnessing. In this case, the stock wiring is more than ample enough to handle the power that we'll be feeding through it. The head unit is ready to go back in now, so we're going to show you what it looks like before we stuff it in. Module here like we showed you before, clean wiring of course. All our RCAs are hooked up for front, rear and subwoofer. Bluetooth mic is run. We placed in the gauge cluster over here nice and cleanly. And we're ready to put this thing in. Now on some of these modules you might notice an extra harness, that was for the steering wheel control module interface. This vehicle does not have steering wheel controls on the back of the steering wheel so we don't need to worry about that. But you see it goes in nice and clean. Even though you can't see it, we want to keep it nice and professional. We got the first portion of our fiberglass enclosure done. Now the nice thing about a Dodge Ram is it's kind of a cheater when it comes to doing any of the major three trucks, whether Dodge, GM, or four, mainly because they have a storage compartment here that is a tub on its own. So the trucks actually a mold right off the bat. So these trucks are awesome to do custom enclosures in. It takes a lot of the thinking out of it. So we have our frame down, I've already released the screws. We have our first layer of glass already done. Now we're able to pop this out of the truck and then we're going to reinforce it with more layers. We're going to stiffen this up quite a bit and then we can build our top afterwards. We now have the enclosure outside the vehicle. Why you want it outside is you have less chance of actually spilling resin in the vehicle at this point. So try to do most of your work with fiberglass outside. This is how we like to do it. And it's going to be a little bit easier for me to show you what's going on. Also with the enclosure outside the vehicle with regular light hitting it, we can see if there's any imperfections or any weak spots a lot easier. Uh, I'm not going to spend all this time showing you me laying uh, mat because that's just going to be boring, but I'll show you a couple pieces just so you see what's going on. So the way I like to start is, is to, this is, I've already laid another layer down, so this is already wet, but I like to usually put a little bit down so I can hit the other side. And I'm going to show you a very, pretty old school technique, but very effective. So with a brush, we're just going to dab away at it, starting from the middle, working our way out. We don't want to lay too much, but we don't want to lay too little. So what we want to see is this thing basically turn translucent so we can see through it. And because we're on incline, if stuff pours down, sometimes you want to put on another piece where it's pooling up and soak up that material. Remember to also wear a respirator when you're working with this stuff. Also when you're laying down, try to do like a crisscross pattern. I know it's already woven, it's already crisscross, but this way we, we're trying to maximize strength in our structure and getting a lot of coverage at the same time. And depending on your, the environment you're working in, like if it's a cooler day, you're going to make your batch with your MEKP a little bit hotter. Uh, if it's a really hot day, you might want to uh, mix a little bit cooler. That way your flash time's not so quick because you want to be efficient. We want, like, we want to be efficient with our material, not waste it. So we want to use all of this up in one shot. We don't want this gumming up and then it's just a waste of resin. So this is basically what we did in the truck. Of course, we taped it and had a mold release agent. So it popped out nicely. And then we spend a little bit of time here 
working our way thoroughly around the enclosure, making sure we layer it up nicely so it's got a lot of str uh, strength to it. Because the stiffer this is and relatively more dense it is, it's just going to be a better sounding enclosure. The top's roughly done now. I've routed out the holes for it and the whole shape's been routed out so it's nice and exact how we'd like to get, put it in. But it's boring. Now you could deliver it like this. You could attach it to the rest of the enclosure. You could slot the subs in um, after you carpet it. And it's reasonably presentable. But it's just, it's kind of a boring piece right now. So, you know, we're going to play the wood. You know, when I'm bored, I just like to play with my wood. So even though we're doing a basic installation, we can still dress up the top a bit just by adding a couple things to the top. So what I propose we're going to use is we're going to recess the subwoofer into the material and we're going to brace it up as well because we're going to reduce the thickness so we have to make it thicker again so we have a good thick mounting surface for the subwoofer. So we're going to use this rabbit bit right here and that's going to be the exact width we need for the JLW3s. To finish off the entire top we're going to round it over with this. I got all these uh, router bits from 12 volt tools so talk to Joey, he's an awesome guy, and he has a plethora of bits. It's some of the best I've ever seen in the industry, and it's just amazing. It really opens up your eyes what you can start to do with wood when you use 12-volt uh, tools bits. <laughs> Hopefully you can see this part. I only did part of the top because I wanted to show you the difference. Hopefully you can see it on camera. So you see here, you have a nice smooth round over edge. It's going to look a lot more finished once you upholster it with carpet or vinyl. If you're going to go vinyling though, you're probably going to have to go a few more steps. Carpet, you can hide a lot of the imperfections. As opposed to here where it's just been routed with the spiral bit, the flush bit spiral bit. And you can see the difference. And just that little, just that little extra effort makes it look a lot more finished compared to this. Top's pretty finished now. So this is recessed. We'll still have the brace up underneath it. Round it over. Looks good. It's presentable. But it still needs a bit more. Every time I do these boxes without putting something in the middle, it just looks really wide. Like you have all this real estate here that is just flat. So we like to fill it. There's different ways you can put like a logo in the middle or some sort of design. This is a very basic entry level sub enclosure. So what we're going to do is what I like to call is I'm going to put hot rod lines down. In the real world, people just call them lines. But the reason why I call them hot rod lines is because I've seen a lot of builds in older muscle cars, like cars in the 50s and 60s, a lot of guys are building. They put these nice lines in the dash and it emulates a lot of lines that they would do in the design of the cars before. So I just call them that. Now there's several ways to create these lines. You can either use a trim router of some sort. I like to do this on the table saw because we're using carpet 
So we don't need to have a beveled line or anything. It doesn't have to be curved. We can just have something with 90 degrees in it. And I'm going to do it five blade lengths wide. Um, for me, this is just quick and easy. Uh, we're going to only go a couple centimeters up so we don't disturb the actual structure of the wood. We're just doing this for looks. So that's the beginning of it, and I'll go ahead and finish up and put in all the lines that I want. So we didn't go, because of the material we're using, we didn't sink the subman all the way, and I wanted to keep it a little bit thicker because I'll get more strength. Two, the carpet's really fuzzy, so it's going to come up a bit, um, but you can get the slower if you want to. It's really up to you, however you're building it. Here we got our lines in five blade lengths wide on the table saw. Line them all up with the subwoofer holes here so now it actually has this nice flow but it cuts up the look of it so it doesn't look so wide and boring anymore. A couple days before I routed out these rings because I had some extra time so that way we could speed up this job today. Uh, you can see here uh, beforehand these were clamped down so before, uh, to allow them to cure. So these rings now add more uh, material so we have the strength back because as you saw before when I uh, routed out to countersink the subs in, we lost material. Uh, we're using a PL Premium because I prefer this material for an, an adhesive because it's a urethane base, so it has more flexibility as opposed to wood glue. Wood glue works great too. I've been using this though for a while and it's worked really well. I just like the idea of using a urethane based adhesive because there's so much sound pressure that goes on these enclosures. Wood glue is typically actually brittle, so the idea of urethane, it's just going to withstand the, the abuse of those subs over time. Uh, I've never seen wood glue though fail, it's just that I just like the idea of using uh, PL Premium in this case. We have the top piece now fastened to the top. Uh, one little thing we do is where the fiberglass meets the trim, we actually put our bead of PL Premium across that and then the top gets secured down. So what we do is we go ahead and we countersink all the holes, we pre-drill everything, countersink it, and then fire screws along the perimeter. So we're entering the final stages of the enclosure now. Uh, this is the bottom piece. What I do to help make it a little bit stronger and ensure I have 100% seal is we glass over the fiberglass that meets the original piece of MDF that we use for the trim to base everything off of. What this does is it gives us more surface area for it to actually connect to each other so we have more structure and if there's the slightest bit chance that for some reason there's a hole on the other side which we've already double checked there isn't but we're ensuring that there's a complete seal all the way around. So we've completed the data starter so we have our 5x10 tucked away here as well as the smart start module. All the wiring is tucked away. We also have our glass break sensor with the mic up here and our shock sensor. Let's test the system now. So with the 5X10, we have full integration with the CAN bus system. So when I hit lock, we also arm on the factory key fob, we also arm the 5X10. Hit unlock. So we get our first door to unlock. All the other doors follow afterwards, just like factory. But we can take it one step further. So we're testing here right now the smart start. So I'm can't do it on the cell phone because it's not my cell phone, but I can test on the computer before I deliver it to the customer. So hit lock. Unlock. And of course we can remote start as well. So we've carpeted the box for the most part, just got to touch up some things. Now you're probably wondering about those lines that we did earlier. 
So they're all right here. I'm going to show you how we actually get them to appear afterwards. So we glued both the carpet and the enclosure itself, and now we just have to work the carpet into the lines to make them show up. Now because it was five wide, I worked the edges out. We see the carpet's kind of fuzzy, so you had to make the lines wider in order to actually see it because it'll actually come back in. If I only made it one blade length, you'd barely see these things. On the final stage of the carpeting, we are going to trim all this off. But before we do that, we want to make sure that the carpet does stay on there. We're not going to rely purely on the adhesive. So on the back side, we just run a staples along the perimeter. So the enclosure's all done, carpeted up. We painted the underneath of it with truck bed liner to give it a more finished look. And I just want to show you guys what our amps look like underneath. So we disc, uh, we use a distribution block in the back, so on four gauge Stinger Elite wiring, it can handle both these amplifiers. They're just tucked away back, nice and neat. We already tuned everything, so we're ready to drop this all in. And there you have it. Sound system's all done. It's, looks nice and clean. And now we can listen to this thing. So the sound system's all done now. Head unit's operational. What we did also, which is nice about certain head units are, we can actually change the lightning here to the color. Uh, I like to change it to the color of the gauges. You can change it wherever you want, but I just think it looks more streamlined when it matches the gauges. But that's enough talking. You probably want to hear this thing now. So to recap, it's DCHI 6x9s and all four doors, JL Audio subs, and JL Audio amplifiers, and a JVC double dim screen with Bluetooth.